I love that music. I don't I know where I got it. <laughs> I don't know where I got it from, but I absolutely love that music. Every time it comes on, I start rocking my shoulder. <laughs> so I wasn't rocking anything, but I'm like, oh yeah. Uh huh. So welcome to the broadcast. Thank you for being here. I'm Glad really you. excited that you are here. Um, we are streaming live into the Facebook uh, group nonprofit professionals exchange, just in case. And um, as we get into this, um, I really just want to make sure that um, we welcome everyone to Sipping Tea with Sabrina. And in a second, we're going to be sharing the tea on leadership for nonprofits. But if you've not met me before, I am Sabrina. I'm the founder of Supporting World Hope, a nonprofit consulting company. I started after 25 years in the industry. And we have with us today, Ms. Sherilyn Payton and of Payton Place Coaching and Consulting. And I'm absolutely excited to have this conversation um, because leadership is critical uh, to success of your nonprofit or to any endeavor. And Ms. Payton is the leadership guru in my head. Um, I met her uh, through a consulting group I'm a part of called Nonprofitist, and I sit back in awe every time she makes a comment. She doesn't know that. So you know that now. <laughs> uh, sit back in awe every time she makes a comment because she absolutely is a leader, and she demonstrates it every time I've had an encounter um, with her. But before we start, um, if as you're joining us, I see people are starting to join. If you can click the heart or the like button, if you can hear me loud and clear, and let me know where you're watching from, even if you're watching in replay, because that's going to help us with these, you know, fabulous things called algorithms. Um, Facebook is going to see, you know, interaction on the post, and they're going to keep the feed to the top, and they're going to promote it. So help us promote it. And I also, you know, I like to call out people. And I know my Miss Pitts is here, Andrea Pitts. So thank you. She always shows up live. So Miss Peyton, share a little bit about yourself and your experience. Well, all right. I am, uh, as you said, um, I'm a coach, but I'm also a nonprofit consultant focusing on leaders within organizations. Uh, my preference, my happy place, is not only working with nonprofit leaders who serve the under-resourced and uh, marginalized communities and individuals, but also uh, minority women, um, minority and women-owned businesses and enterprises. So that's an area where I have chosen to give my time, talent, and resources because I feel that that's uh, somewhat neglected. Um, one of the surveys I did recently um, indicated that nine out of 10 nonprofit leaders have never had a coach. They've had multiple consultants work within their organizations, but most have never had the benefit of a leadership coach or someone that they can ideate with and to support them through their growth personally and for their organization. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I am, uh, Peyton Place is eight years old. We are um, a kind of a collaborative organization. Uh, although I don't have staff, I have multiple coaches and consultants that I work with to support the organizations that I um, ally myself with or align myself with. Because I do see myself as someone who supports their vision long term and not just for the time of the contract. So that's what makes me and my business different. You know, it's very interesting that you say that because even in my journey over 20 something plus years, I think I finally got a coach probably like the last within the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, you know, went through it. I had some mentors, but not a official coach until I was like 15 years in it because no one ever 
talk to me about coaching. I didn't even know it was available to me, if that makes any sense. It does. Can I just tell you one other thing? Mm -hmm. So I had the wonderful opportunity to lead a BIPOC group of leaders that are all nonprofit executives, co-executives, uh, co executive directors, co-executive directors, and founders. Of the 13 of them, not a single one had ever had a coach. And what we're finding is that minority leaders in particular don't generally get that kind of support. It's not made available to us. It's not talked about in our circles and in the spaces that we occupy. Mm -hmm. So we have to either seek it out or someone has to seek us out. So that's that's one of the reasons that I really am very committed and passionate about showing up in those spaces. And and so, I mean, this is not a question that I have here. <laughs> I'm going to start out with that. But I do want to say um, what coaching in itself, what mm -hmm. is the benefit for people that are listening right now who fall in that? What is the benefit of coaching? Because they confuse coaching and consulting. Okay. So I always say that if you have a, a really good consultant, they have some elements of coaching built into their practice because basically what coaching allows, the it's a partnership between you and the individual that allows you to help them become more aware of themselves, how they show up in the world. It's focused on helping them achieve more this is, I find that coaching works best for high achievers. Mm -hmm. Not those that are kind of just floundering. They're probably not ready for coaching, but coaching works best for the person who might say, I have so much on my plate. I have difficulty prioritizing and everything is brilliant, right? They've got 99 different visions that you're trying to make manifest. Mm -hmm. And what the coach comes alongside and does is say, hey, if, if you could only give your time, attention, and talent to one or two things, you know, what would that be? And why is it important? So mm -hmm. it's really about engaging around questions, helping them find alignment with what they say is important, helping to, them to identify um, incongruence mm -hmm. in what they're saying and what they're doing. A lot of what we believe about ourselves, limiting beliefs and things like that. So the coach mm -hmm. comes along to help you see those things and question why you're doing it or why you're not doing it and help you create a plan to move forward. Yeah. So it's creating awareness, vision, and action planning. Yeah. And then working through barriers to achieving those so y'all see why I have Miss Peyton here. We haven't even got to our official first question and she's already dropping knowledge. So I promised her 45, no more than 45 minutes, right? But I got, I, you know, I'm going to prepare you because I might have some, you might say something that might inspire another question, okay? So I want to press. I love that. you as much as you love me. So I just want to tell you, I, I blocked the morning for you up until I think 1115. So. Okay, perfect, perfect. So I have Andrea here who, um, Andrea is someone who's that exactly who you described high achiever. She talks about having multiple things going on. And so I think, you know, um, I know this is going to help her. But as we get into this conversation, one of the first things I want to do is clarify what is leadership versus management? Because I think a lot of times people confuse those two. That's an excellent question. And kind of like, you know, coaching and consulting, I'll say you need some elements of both. Mm -hmm. So it's not an either or that kind of dichotomous thinking, but we have to bring those two and integrate them. So think about it like this. Managing is very task, behavior, action, get it done focused, right? Um, very tactical. However, leadership is very people-centered, 
and collaborative. And what you'll find, you'll know when you're being led because there's a level of inspiration and influence that comes into play where if there's just a manager type role, the individual is focused on what do I need to do to motivate you in this moment to get this task done mm -hmm. and to meet the main objectives of the organization in a meaningful way, in a consistent way. Leadership is more big picture, long term. We're going together. What can I do to support you? How are you feeling on the journey? And it is very, very much about what happens around the vision versus the task. That's my summary. Okay. And, and so, I always say pay attention to the behavior okay. and you'll know what the person is doing, whether they're managing, just trying to get stuff done or they're leading. Okay. And so what, what, what are the qualities of a good nonprofit leader? Oh, I love that question so much. So we talk about emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't really pay attention to what that is and how it shows up. How self-aware is a person? So sometimes we are, our traumas and triggers are what are causing us to show up a certain way versus leaning into this emotional intelli intelligence that we have, being less reactive for one, so that ability to self-regulate, not blow up, not, uh, oh my God, there's a crisis. Everything is not a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, paying attention to, okay, so I said emotional intelligence. So mm -hmm. self-awareness, self-regulation, the ability to show empathy to the people that you, that you work with and lead. Um, communicating in a way that is meaningful and well-resourced. And what I mean by you think through how you're going to talk to people based on what they need versus what you want to give them. Mm -hmm. And communication also includes listening. So those are some of the qualities I would say, being judicious, uh, prescient, all of those things matter to the people that you lead and it builds buy-in and trust. Mm -hmm. So th those things are key. Um, and if I were to say one thing right now, for sure, making sure that you as a leader, one good quality that you are um, inclusive. Mm -hmm. And that means something different to everybody. I would say more, but I'll leave it there. Yeah. That, that, that makes a whole lot of sense. And I will say, that, you know, as I started out on this journey, um, emotional intelligence was not my strong suit, <laughs> but you can work on that. <laughs> I read a lot of books, did a lot of things to, to work on that. And um, it really helped me and it changed that dynamic um, of, of who I was. Can you still see me? I can, I can. Okay, perfect. I don't know what happened. My screen went black, but we're going to keep going with it. So it changed that dynamic of, of everything for me. And so um, for those who might struggle with it, I do want to say you can work on that. And it's going to make a difference, especially working with your board. Um, mm -hmm. that, that really helped me. And then as I grew, working with staff, you know. Yes. And so I, I know that's what I did again. But how can you foster, you know, emotional intelligence? How can you foster those leadership qualities that you need? So can I can I add one other thing? So what, what you just said just now, I, I applaud you for recognizing that you needed to work on that. So that's the first thing. OK. Especially if you're someone who your interpersonal skills, because that's part of emotional intelligence. Relating with others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're someone who's kind of conflict avoidant or things like that just recognizing is the first way to foster and nurture and then to practice practice those things so there's self-assessments that we do and hopefully we're doing them even if we're like me 
I do an annual self-assessment because I'm a private business that no one is a boss to me, but me. Mm -hmm. So I coach myself. I, I have coach. I have a therapist. I have all the things in my toolbox to help me continue to grow. So what nurturing means is being on a journey of, of consistent and learning, learning journey, mm -hmm. making sure that you stay aware of your blind spots and the gaps. So I want to be a better listener, but I know right now I'm probably not. So here are the things I'm going to practice and do and ask someone to check in with me and hold me accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, people can't really hold us accountable, but they can check in with us so we can hold ourselves accountable. Right. Uh, and then seek out someone who models that. Mm -hmm and say, you know, I really would like to just spend some time observing. Or can you say more about how you a, you were able to achieve this level of compassion, uh, listening? I always feel heard and seen by you. How do you do that? How do you cultivate that skill? So that's, that's what I say. And so when you say uh, you assess yourself each year, is that a informal assessment or is that a formal assessment how do you assess yourself it's both story? it's okay. both so because i do idps for other organizations so idp individual development plans particularly for leaders mm -hmm. from leaders who have you know harvard graduate background phds to people returning to society from the carceral system <clears throat> i take some of those same questions and i also do a 360 feedback with my clients mm -hmm. and my friends. Yeah. How am I doing? Where and if, and if someone responds that I don't have anything I need to work on, I take them off the list. Yeah, they're not putting a lot of thought into it. It's not helpful. Come yeah. on. Now. Everybody <laughs> needs to grow in some area. Yes. None of us are perfect. That doesn't exist actually. So yeah. us perfectionists out here who have that issue from time to time, it's usually a trauma response. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Some it, somebody said at some point in that we could have been nine. Somebody said, Oh, you're not good enough for this or that. And then we start living into this perfection approach to life. And it's not real. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. even attainable. Yeah. Yeah. Feedback is uh feedback is caring. You know, I still have some 360 evaluations that I received from uh 10 years ago. Because yeah, it, 10 years ago, because it speaks again to that emotional intelligence about me. Um, I have to remind myself when people come in a room or talking to me, I need to give them eye contact. I don't need to keep working. And so I read those every now and then I pull them out and I read them and I keep trying to work on it and work on it and work on it. And so, like you say, it's a continual working process. So if you have an organization, how do you nurture leadership and within all levels of that organization? It's it's the same thing. Have you asked your people, you know, what they need? That's that's a key thing. That's one thing I'm working on right now in four different organizations. I'm saying, if you do the performance evaluation and stick it in the drawer, never revisit it throughout the, the quarter, throughout the throughout the year at various different points, Whatever that person has said is not going to stay with you. So you need to constantly kind of be keeping notes on things that they've said that they need or concerns that they have. Um, include them, include them and don't just have a meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Where the leadership team is the focus and not include those from the receptionist to the the person who coordinates the the um, events well, everyone give them voice so again when we think about nurturing something and cultivating something basically it's giving it some attention and space and 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 that's that's really that's really critical cuz i think sometimes we exclude people and every, like you said, everybody needs attention and space. Everybody wants to be or feel valued, right? So valued. 
Yes, this is awesome. So if you're just joining us, you know, welcome to the broadcast. We're currently talking about leadership for nonprofits, and we've covered uh, some topics around, you know, emotional intelligence, which really struck at me, needing, needing assessment. The fact that we need coaches and some of us walk through this journey and we don't have a, a coach. And so, you know, thank you for joining. Let us know where you're watching from. Again, you click the heart or the like button um, to let us know. And it's going to help us with our algorithms. And as we go through this, if you have any questions, post those questions, because at the end, we're going to, you know, um, have some time for a little conversation. I'll offer that up to you because this is so important, um, leadership and, and knowing that. And so I share with me, what are some of the leadership challenges that you've seen nonprofits face, Ms. Payton? Sabrina, I, I, I'm going to say this, and I want everybody to really pay attention to themselves in this way. Misalignment, mm. incongruence and misalignment. So, every, you know, every organization that I work with, before I say yes to them, I research their organization. I research their, <clears throat> their leaders and their board. <clears throat> I want to come in not only well-informed, but with a good idea of the individuals. So one of the things that I didn't say earlier about um, nurturing leadership is kind of assessing the grit that people have, the, the gifts and talents that they have, how they're showing up in the world as well as in the organization. When you see statements like, we... Say, say, for example, an organization was founded in 1957. Mm -hmm. We know the climate of the world at that mm -hmm. time, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly in the U.S., we know what was going on. And if you see a statement mm -hmm. on their website that has to do with equity, and it says something like, since our founding, we have been an inclusive organization. It's not possible. It's aspirational. Yes, mm -hmm. we would like to think of ourselves as kind and good and having done all things well, but that's generally not the case. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I would say to people is just look at it for what it is. Do a racial equity study. How many people have you had in your organization of color, female? with varied backgrounds. And if you do the racial equity study, then you can take a realistic approach to improving the inequities. But the biggest challenge I see is that people are dishonest with themselves inside the founders. And they'll say things like, well, I'm, we're doing the best we can with what we have. Are you really though? You have money for professional development and training, but you won't invest in your people. You get the lion's share of the development because you're the quote unquote leader. But what if you divvied it up across all of your people and supported everyone? I, I, I really appreciate pathway planning versus succession mm -hmm. planning. It's outdated. It doesn't work. And most people don't even do it right. Most organizations don't do it right. Consultants are guilty as well. Mm -hmm. So I would just say, instead of us thinking so narrowly about how we show up in the world, let's look at it more holistically and to ask questions like, how am I demonstrating the values that I say are important in my organization? How is my team demonstrating those values? Values um, like um, belonging. People mm -hmm. talk a lot about belonging now, right? Mm -hmm. And to ask each individual, like, how am I showing up? How are you showing up? Giving me an example of the best way that we are doing this. And to ask ourselves also, if we created that vision and mission, is it time to iterate it? Like, is this irrelevant? 
not so much is it true that too but is it relevant to where we're trying to go with this organization so revisioning is sometimes the key to that level of authenticity mm -hmm. because authenticity creates buy-in and trust and increases what you do like you get more money like the right. fundraising and the capacity building part we have got to take a better look a closer look and a more honest look at how we are showing up yep it makes a huge difference on, on that so y'all can see why i have her here i'm just sitting here going mm, i need to get me another coach and you're gonna be it because i need this in my life um i just this is awesome so nonprofit uh fails versus nonprofit excel so what is the leadership difference when you see a nonprofit that's failing and one that's you know excelling what's the difference so I, I want to say something that might be a little controversial and you know okay. it's my style. Yes. I use the term thriving organizations versus. Okay. So here's what I don't believe success is in a nonprofit organization specifically. And that's that that's my world. Like that's where I want to be in nonprofit. What it is not is a team full of overworked, burned out folks. That's what success is not. And that's what most nonprofits have right now. True. Unaddressed burnout and it's cyclical. Even if you get a sabbatical, you come right back to the same overwhelm, the same misalignment, lack of clarity, all of that stuff. is yep. still present. So you taking a break and stepping away, you have anxiety coming back because it didn't go away. Yep. So none of that is being addressed. Success also does not look like you doing everything. Even if you're doing it well, public facing, we know what's going on in house. We know what's going on internally with you. You're not sleeping. You're not taking care of yourself. You're you can probably get cancer. Uh -huh. <laughs> Look, you can get cancer. <laughs> All of that stuff shows up in mm -hmm. your body. Yep. And there's a there's a saying I can't think of, but um, it's it's about like trauma, unaddressed. Trauma. It's going to ooze out somewhere. Even if you think you're holding it, you got it, you got it, you got it. It's going to ooze out because it we don't have the capacity to hold that stuff. We weren't built for that. So. In the grander scheme of things, most organizations, after I assess them and I talk to them and I see, they look wildly successful. They got lots of money coming in. They're getting new staff. But internally, they don't have the, the guide points and the foundational things in order to sustain all of that. Mm -hmm. And they're working every day to get more. Like we need more money and we need more people. Well, are you taking care of the people that you got? And are you stewarding the money you already have? When was the last time you even checked? Yep. Did a, a proper program evaluation to find out like, why are we doing this again? And is it working? Are people giving us feedback the same they appreciate it? And, and it's meeting their need? Or is it more paternalistic? We're telling people what they need versus doing focus groups and things like that to find out what is it we really should be providing. So I've kind of given you a little mix. I'm sorry I didn't answer directly because it's, it's not a question I can answer directly, really. You know what? It is OK, because it brings back to the one and only time that I did have a coaching experience, um, it, you know, in that 15 year journey. And I remember being you know, like you said, it's going to manifest somewhere and mine manifested in illness, but I was on that constant doing and getting more and just burning out and not only burning myself out, burning, bless you, burning my staff out. And I, that was me. And I remember with the coach, it was like, do 
less to do more. That was one of the things that's that crystallized. Brilliant. That's brilliant. It and one was. of the things that I ask all of my clients, and I want you all who are listening um, to Sabrina, y'all keep coming. She's always got some wonderful stuff going on over here. But ask yourself this question. How do I know when it's enough? Mm -hmm. What measure, what do I have in place where is, you know, I had somebody tell me, well, over the next five years, I need to make $10 million. I was like, why is that the number? And let's drill down into it. Have you even considered what you need and how much is enough? That will help lessen anxiety. Mm -hmm. It'll get rid of some of that imposter syndrome stuff. All of this comparisons that happen, like because so-and-so made 10, 10 million, I, I need to make, no. What do you need? What's right for you? Yeah, it's a hard conversation. It's a hard conversation to have. Um, and that's why you need someone to help you through that conversation. Um, and I like, you know, it is, it's maybe it's focusing on, on a thriving organization and what is right for your organization and what is right for you. Um, that's, that's brilliant. I think that um, one of the things that people struggle with a lot, and especially in my group, because, you know, my group is a lot of um, startups yeah. and they're probably trying to get to that magic number, like you say, you know, and don't know why, <laughs> but they're they're trying to get there um, because that's what success looks like uh, for them. And <laughs> because they're comparing themselves to others. Right. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, one of the things that I know uh, that they struggle with a lot is um, building a board, like their board leadership capacity. So if you are in that phase of your nonprofit journey, how would you, how, what would you tell them? What are some of the best practices for, for those in that stage? Okay. I love that question so much, Sabrina, because... If we would focus there um, just a, a reasonable amount of time, the biggest thing I would say is don't don't recruit your board out of desperation. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you know that what you have to offer is good. Articulate that vision very well. Have a vision casting session. See who catches the vision. See who's willing to walk with you and, and hold that fiduciary and other responsibility close to the chest. Close, hold it to heart, right? Take care with it as well as be a voice to help move it and push it and advocate for it. Definitely they don't recruit your board out of desperation. I need five people by the end of the month. <laughs> Um, I got to get my bylaws, you know, mm -hmm. take care in the foundation and you won't have the challenges. And the biggest part, have a plan in place for tr board transition. Mm -hmm. Nobody should be on your board 25 years. Nobody. <laughs> they can still support your organization. I've, I've been in spaces mm -hmm. where I've supported organizations and I still give to those organizations. I don't even have a daily or routine interaction with them, but I still write them a check. It may be $500, it may be $5,000, whatever. I don't have to be sitting on your board to support your organization. If you do the work on the front end, I will continue to support your work for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So my biggest thing that I'm seeing is this reactionary recruiting. Oh my God, our co-chair is... And our chairman is and our treasurer is, what is your plan? And why aren't you constantly looking for talent mm -hmm. and members of your community who love your work? Even if your work is new, people know about you. And if they don't know about you, that's a problem in and of itself. You're not yes. visible. If you're not visible in your community, you may need to rethink your startup process. I say the same thing to politicians. 
Don't come asking for my vote. <laughs> I haven't seen you ever. Exactly. Ever in my community. Get away from me. Not get away. Get away <laughs> from me. I don't know you. I don't know you. I haven't seen you in a city. And I'm all in the community. Mm -hmm. If I haven't seen you, you're not there. Because mm -hmm. I'm all from North Memphis to South Memphis to <laughs> Orange Mountain. I'm, Whitehead, I'm everywhere. If I've never seen you, you're not doing your job. So I would say to them with just the most love and care and compassion that I can, listen, darling, you might need to rethink your plan because if folks don't know you, they're not going to trust you. Thank you. That is the key where leadership and fundraising meets. People need to know, like, and trust you. Bottom line. Yeah. Um, so um, what is your advice to nonprofit CEOs as it relates to leadership? Like your best advice, like here it is, lay it all out there. <laughs> From day one, do not try to do it all. <laughs> Multitasking is a unicorn. Our brains are not wired. Yes, can we short term? do all of the things. But what I was saying earlier, that burnout, your reactivity, it turns into trauma is what it turns into. It's hard to love what you do when you're always having to put the thing out a fire. So go into it with a clear plan. Who's going to do what? What is your support system? The same if you were starting a business, not even a nonprofit. Just again, thinking of CEO or founder. Don't go into this with, a, with the mindset that you can or should do it all. Even if it means you find you a little intern somewhere at the local university to support you administratively or a mentor. Everybody that calls themselves a leader should have at least one mentee. If you don't, Think about that. Just think about it. I'm not going to put a judgment out there on it. But if you don't have anyone that you're mentoring, that your gifts and talents, you're investing them in a human, a person. I would question your leadership style. I would question your leadership approach because all of us as leaders should be giving back and investing even from the beginning. You know, broke and broken you still have something to give because you're still a whole valuable human. If no one's seeking you out for mentorship, check your character, check and see what's going on with you. That it's not attractive or appealing. But Ken, again, are you a leader if no one's following? Are you? If no one's following, you're not. No. So that, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I don't, I, you know, that, yeah. Um, if, you're you know, trying, if you're trying to do everything and if you consistently take that approach, I can guarantee you something is being neglected in your life. Either your people, your processes, your vision, yourself, your, especially yourself for most leaders. Mm -hmm. Oh, the camera we're going the wrong way here yeah living witness to that yeah so you, you you have to be careful on that journey and we have some great people who have joined us kc and rory and you know guys andrea take this in because it it is key um what miss um Sherilyn is sharing is it will change your the ter the trajectory of your organization and not only your organization, you know, I created this group because I care about nonprofit professionals and you need to take care of yourself, not only your, your leadership and, and of course address those leadership, but what, what is more critical that I am hearing is uh, lead yourself, know yourself, take care of yourself. Um, and in taking care of yourself, you will take care and be a great leader for your organization is what I'm hearing. And so I don't know if you have any questions out there. Uh, I'll give you time to put your questions. But if you don't have any questions, I will tell you this. 
Um, I always get questions around fundraising. So if you have any fundraising questions, you know, you can always reach out to me. And my website again, guys, is uh, www.supportingworldhope.com. And um, I'm here to help with fundraising uh, questions and and coaching around fundraising. And Miss um, Miss um, Peyton, I want to thank you again, uh, guys, for uh, those that um, don't know. Uh, there is a lot of groups out there you can be a part of. And one of the groups that, again, I said at the top that I'm a part of is the nonprofitists. And this is where I met Miss Sherilyn. And as you see, when she speaks, you talk about uh, the energy that someone brings to the room. The energy she brings to the room is that of leadership and authority and you just, you you said, you know, that's my style, that controversial. I don't think it's controversial at all. I think it's like calling people out. I love it. I love it. You ask the hard questions. You make the hard statements and you don't let people um, slide. You know, like slide, like you're not going to let me BS even myself. And I love that about you. <laughs> I absolutely love that about you. Um, So I, I, I want to thank you for coming into this group and sharing your knowledge. Um, how can people contact you? Well, I am I, I'm on social media. So it's Peyton Place Coaching on Facebook. And um, I prefer reach out to me via my website. I always respond to my inquiries. Um, you can set an appointment with me on my website. So it's www.peytonplacecoaching.com. And also there are consultancy offerings on my page. You can see the things I offer and I'm very transparent. My prices are listed. Mm -hmm. I don't try to, you know, I don't play games. You know, my style as Sabrina said, I'm just kind of out there straightforward. <laughs> and I will say this, when I started my practice, my goal was to make coaching affordable for everyone. So I understand that you don't have $10,000 to pay for coaching. I get that. I didn't have $10,000 to pay for coaching. So it's very affordable and the benefit much outweigh the return on investment. I have had rave reviews from all over and I don't think people are blowing smoke. I think they are being legitimately transformed by my approach to coaching, which is unique. I try to make sure I see you fully and I hear you and I support you in the way you wish to be supported and not what I think you need. Mm -hmm. So that, um, you know, I have a an African um, quote and saying built into all of the things. So at the end of the day, again, whether no matter your background or your ethnicity, I'm still a whole black woman with an F from the effort diaspora. So in that way, I, uh, my approach is Sawubona and that is to see you and to see all of you. That's your lived experience, your background, everything that makes you who you are, your ancestry, to consider all of those things as I support you on your journey. <sighs> Brush of fresh air. And so, you know, thank you so much again. And I want to, I, I end these uh, broadcasts uh, with this and I will leave you with this because I cannot top that guys. Um, your mission matters and deserves to be highlighted in the community. Your mission matters and can be an inspiration to those who need it the most. Your mission matters and deserves to be funded to its fullest capacity. And just to let you know, our next sipping tea will be on July the 20th with Rebecca Brett. And we'll be talking about demonstrating program impact. And that is sipping tea with Sabrina. I will see y'all later. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank